My topic tonight concerns that larger perspective seen through the lens of the question, what gods do we believe in now? And I want to mix things up a bit by addressing a polarization which looms large in your culture, especially in a university context. One of the most misleading aspects of the so-called culture wars is the sense that to be conservative probably means to be religious, while to be radical would mean to be secular. But that religious-secular divide is itself deeply problematic. And I want to suggest this evening that both halves of it need looking at in quite a new way. First, I need to set the scene in terms of the history of ideas, our ideas. By the way, forgive me if I sip coffee. Um, I flew in yesterday, and my body is telling me it's 2 o'clock in the morning, so I just need something to help me make sure I'm staying on track here. All of us in the Western world are, for better or worse, children of the Enlightenment. And the main idea of the Enlightenment, if I can horribly overgeneralize, was rooted in one particular ancient philosophy. And this was the philosophy called Epicureanism. Epicurus lived in the 3rd century BC. His ideas were boosted in the 1st century BC by the poet Lucretius. And you could sum it all up like this. The gods, if they exist, are a long way away. They don't bother about us, so relax and enjoy your life. That, in fact, was used almost unchanged as a slogan for the new atheist movement, represented by Richard Dawkins, who recently hired some advertising space on London buses to put out the message, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Fascinating. Now, there are three things to note about ancient and modern Epicureanism and how it's affected the way we think now. First, Epicurus and Lucretius were reacting strongly not against ancient Judaism, not against Christianity, which hadn't been invented yet. They were reacting against certain types of ancient paganism, which frightened people by suggesting that there were gods all over the place and that they were out to get you and that if they didn't make life miserable for you here, they probably would hereafter. You then get the same reaction, interestingly, in the 15th century AD, when the medieval church had borrowed a lot of those ancient pagan ideas about unpredictable divine anger to frighten people into believing or behaving, and the rediscovery of Lucretius in 1417, and thus of Epicureanism, came to many as welcome good news. And bringing it a bit closer to home, for you at least, when Thomas Jefferson declared in the 18th century that he was an Epicurean, he and his Enlightenment colleagues were consciously reacting against a kind of Christian teaching that threatened people with an angry God, both here and hereafter. Now, you might ask, what's that got to do with the challenges that we face in today's university culture? Simply this, my second point, that Epicureanism wasn't the foundation of modern science, but it was part of the foundation of what we might call modern scientism. For Epicurus, the entire world, including human beings, was composed of what he called atoms. Not exactly what we mean by that word, but not much different either. And these atoms, he claimed, behaved the way they did, entirely under their own impulses, including the unpredictable behavior he called the swerve, which caused atoms to combine in new ways, leading to evolution. This is not mid-19th century, this is 3rd century BC, leading, therefore, to new forms of life. So Epicurus, by splitting off our world from any possibility of divine intervention or encounter, he gave to the world a kind of autonomy, an independence. This independence is the ancestor of the Enlightenment's claim to scientific autonomy. It's also, of course, the root of modern political autonomy, the cousin of scientific autonomy. The parallel development of those two in the Western world ought to give us food for thought. Just as in Epicureanism, you get rid of divine interference, and let the natural world evolve in its own way, so you get rid of the divine right of kings and let democracy develop in its own way. That belief has driven our Western assumption that when countries elsewhere in the world get rid of their tyrants or dictators, 
they will naturally want to become Western-style democracies. And when that doesn't happen, as it hasn't, we have no other narrative to help us understand what's going on. In fact, letting systems do their own thing, as Marx saw clearly, might well mean that, like some elements in the natural world, they boil over into revolution. An Epicurean vision of politics would need to allow for the equivalent of volcanoes. So here then are my first two introductory points. First, Epicureanism, ancient and modern, has reacted against a perception of an angry and threatening God. And second, it results in detaching divinity from the world of space, time and matter, allowing the world, the natural world, the political order to develop and evolve under their own steam. And this brings me to my third introductory point, that this confluence of ideas has given birth to what we loosely call secularism. Secularism is a complex phenomenon in itself, but it's become a dominant motif in Western culture and in America and American universities in particular. Despite or perhaps because of the continuing and often strident religiosity of some parts of your culture, by the way, totally different from mine, there is no equivalent in the UK to modern North American fundamentalism only in tiny pockets here and there. But despite or perhaps because of that, there has been increasing pressure in America to banish talk of a god from public life and to conduct everything from scientific research to politics, even to marriage, on the assumption that the world is and means what it is and means without reference to anything beyond its visible and in principle scientifically measurable self. Now, I've put tonight's question into this triple context because it seems to me vital if we are to understand where we've come from and not accept the sacred-secular divide or the religious-non-religious -religious divide as simply part of some unalterable and given cultural landscape. It is no such thing. Ironically, it is itself partly comprehensible as one more cultural evolution in the complex history of the Western world. But it has solidified itself remarkably, politically as well as scientifically, through the remarkable claim made by your forefathers in the late 18th century, who really did believe, and it says so on your dollar bills, that they were seeing the birth of Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages, that's a quote from the Roman poet Virgil in the time of Augustus, 2,000 years earlier. This was to be the new golden age. And that claim, hiding powerfully just under the surface of so many cultural assumptions, particularly but not exclusively here in America, means that any attempt to challenge the perceived rule of secularism is seen as ipso facto a challenge to the great modern order that has brought us so many obvious blessings, not least in the medical sphere. I am sometimes accused of being anti-enlightenment. My stock answer is that actually, though I do have several problems with post-enlightenment modernism, I have no wish to be operated on by either a pre-modern or indeed a post-modern dentist. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go figure. 